Uh, good afternoon. We are going to start session four uh, entitled Earth Observation and Environmental <coughs> Modeling for Flood and Water Resources Management in the Context of Global Climate Change. Uh, the moderator for this session is Prof. Dr. Talbot Brooks. Uh, let me introduce uh, this excellency. Uh, Professor Talbot Brooks joined us from Delta State University in Cleveland, Mississippi, USA, where he serves as the director of the Geospatial Center, named as one of the 15 National Centers of Excellence in Geosciences in 2015. The center specialized in the application of geospatial intelligence to disaster and crisis. Seven of its fa <clears throat> faculty and staff not only work and teach geographic information system, remote sensing, cartography, and similar objects, but they are also active emergency responders who work or volunteer part-time as firefighters, police officers, and medics. The center is also a United Nations Spider Regional Support Office and has fulfilled this role as an active participant in technical advisory missions to nine countries, sponsors an annual meeting about the use of geospatial technologies in arid environments and has created and shared geospatial products and services for nearly 100 disasters during the past 15 years. A special warm greeting from myself and Iranian Space Agency goes to Prof. Dr. Brooks. Doctor, please go ahead. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, this is session four, uh, titled Earth Observation and Environmental Modeling for Flood and Water Resources Management in the t Context of Global Change. Uh, we will stick pretty strictly to a 15 minute schedule. So speakers be warned, uh, stick to your time or, or risk getting cut off, please. Uh, and, and we will open the session with a, a talk titled The Application of Multimodal Risk Assessment in Natural da Disaster Risk Trend Analysis by Louis Ming and Ms. Liao Hanqi from the National Disaster Reduction Center of China. Uh, 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 Mr. Ming, Ms. Hanke, I, I turn the presentation over to you, uh, and perhaps Ms. Gao would be so kind as to run the slides. Yes, because they request uh, uh, Ms. Liu Hanqi to speak first, so. I believe she needs to unmute herself and and begin. I think they have problem with connection. Maybe we can ask Valerie to speak first. Hello. Y Whoever whoever is ready, uh, uh, Emma. I, I guess I guess you can choose. I could speak. I'm ready if you can hear me. Uh, uh, yes, please. Who is this? A uh, Valerie. Valerie Grohl. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Valerie. Go ahead. Okay. So. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. I'll I'll let you introduce yourself then, please. Okay. Um, I will also share my screen. Um, yes. I hope you can see my screen. So um, yes, I'm a postdoctoral scientist of the Ruhr University in Bochum, and I'm also an expert um, contributing to the SPEAR initiative we have together with the ZFL at the University of Bonn and UN Spider in Bonn office. And my talk today is rather what well, we have heard a lot yesterday and today about very detailed studies. It's more about data availability versus data demand when it comes to national disaster risk management and reporting based on the data we have. So you probably have all heard this quote, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So we need a quantification also of damage, of risk, of people affected. And remote sensing gives us a huge potential to monitor all these changes and to finally being able to measure them. 
So we all know about the SENA framework and the four priorities, where the first priority is understanding disaster risk. And we were trying to quantify actually also disaster risk. Looking into the combination of SENA framework and the Agenda 2030 and looking, for example, in the number of people affected, we see a quite good overlay with indicators that also appear in the Agenda 2030 and SDGs. So we have actually people being affected popping up in many of the indicators, but how really measuring these? So we need annual reporting and working with the baseline. That's clear. We all know there is an increase in frequency and intensity of disasters. Looking at the type of disasters, we mostly see floods. And it's also said that floods lead to the highest number of people being affected. But what about the droughts? We have difficulties to really say when a drought starts, how long it takes, when it ends. And we also have a difficulty in saying how many people are affected because for a flood layer, we see how many people live below the water, so to say. But for a drought, it's difficult to say a drought happens on this field, but how many people are depending on this field, for example. Coming to the aspect of drought monitoring, there is a difficulty in how to really define a drought. We have this concept conceptual ways where we have these four different types of droughts and of course we have remote sensing based indicators to for example help us to measure meteorological drought like a lack of rainfall soil moisture drought um, also with radar technology and vegetation information hydrological drought like modeling for example hydrological ways and the socioeconomic drought which is i would say the most difficult one because how to really get the socioeconomic dynamics in this. We have a lot of different indicators we can use. We have already heard some yesterday and today. We all know about the NDVI, EVI, but also temperature we can measure to also go into the vegetation health information. Um, but yeah, there exists a lot of different indicators, but which one to use? With remote sensing, we have, of course, this good spatial resolution. We have temporal dynamics and this consistent data. Coming to an example, so a project uh, I was leading that time in Bonn together with UNU, EHS and UN Spider, and we had two um, national partners here in South Africa and Ukraine. And so we had on one side the international convention and initiatives, we had our national level implementation, South Africa and Ukraine. And checked how was the national reporting and the needs. We had our input data on satellite imagery and socioeconomic data and tried to come up with earth observation based monitoring and measurement of actually indicators. So we worked together with, um, yes, the ZFL, which took care of the remote sensing, UNUHS on the socioeconomic part and UN Spyro, who were um, supporting us with the national needs. So we had here a study in Eastern Cape region where we looked in commercial and communal cropland. Of course, if you have a same lack of rainfall in all these areas, but you can irrigate your field, you do not have the same risk in this area than, for example, a small scale farmer who cannot irrigate his field. So we looked into the different hazard and exposed elements to report for the Sunday framework and the two indicators on affected people and economic loss. We looked into the hazard aspect and into the exposed elements. So for the seasonal parameters, we looked into when does this drought start, um, when does actually the season starts, when is the peak and the end of season, and depending on when the drought occurs, it's as severe for actually the harvest. So you lose more crops if a drought happens um, between the start and the peak of the season than towards the end. So the length of the season might differ. And if, for example, in 2015-16, which we see below on the map, we had a very short season and a very severe drought that actually occurred. So the late rain set in very late. Well, in 2011-12 on the upper map, we see a normal season and we had actually a quite good harvest in this area. So we tried to come up with a national map on drought actually to try to report on the Agenda 2030 and the Sendai framework. And we did this weighted linear combination for the seasonality to come up with a drought severity map. So we had for Eastern Cape region, you see on the top again, 2011-12, a good year and 15-16, the severe drought year. 
So how bringing this now together with the Sendai framework, who, which asked for a number of workers in agriculture with crops damages or damaged or destroyed. So we have our drought severity classes, but we need to also bring them again towards the classes of the Sendai framework, like crops being not affected, damaged, destroyed. So how to really make this classification? We actually had to talk to experts, but we did not have real validation information. So we could come up with a classification for the season 2015-16 based on the Sendai framework. Now we had to bring up actually also socioeconomic data. With all this information coming with, from remote sensing, we had or, already error propagation, but we are no, more close to national reporting. So bringing all this together, with, we had our remote sensing based images uh, and our classification, which was in line with the Sendai framework indicators. And we combined it with number of people per household that are depending on crop production with the hectares of crop land to really come up with an, a number that helps us to inform about the number of workers in agriculture with crops damaged or destroyed. But as you see on the bottom right, which is the final map, we move from a pixel based approach to actually more region based administrative level based approach, which is important for the reporting. So measure to manage as the key variables here. And if we look into the different indicators um, we can use for drought monitoring, vegetation condition, vegetation health, standardized vegetation index, we have all these different thresholds, but to really define them on the local level, we also need the validation data, which is quite, there is definitely a lack nowadays. And looking into the different indicators just next to each other, the standardized precipitation index for drought monitoring based on rainfall, rather here on the dark blue to um, red um, maps on the left side and the right side based on vegetation, we see that we have many different drought indicators also based on the period we are actually looking at them. But the patterns differ. So which one is the indicator to take or the index to take to really do good drought monitoring? Coming to flood monitoring, um, in August 2020, we took over the project management for the floods in Sudan. Um, that was the activation of the international charter. And we were in direct contact, of course, all the time with the Ministry of Agriculture and Natural Resources in Sudan to see what kind of maps they needed. So we had a lot of different data sets, multi-sensor, multi-scale. So it was actually quite nice to have all this data we could use to do a monitoring. And we adapted our scripts very fast to come up with a number of maps um, where the floods are using very high resolution data from, for example, Playad towards um, radar data to actually also um, have not this cloud effect on the maps. We came up with resulting maps on um, where is the land affected, um, where is the water actually. But what they needed in the end was actually numbers. They needed numbers, what or how many people are directly affected by the floods, how much agricultural land is directly affected. Because all these nice maps we made were quite helpful to have a local vision, but in the end to act for the National Disaster Management Organization, they needed clear numbers to really say, okay, these are the areas we have to go to or we, where we have to support. So measure to manage is a quite important aspect here as well. So we have the environmental hazard and the impact monitoring, which is pixel based. But when it comes to the socioeconomic vulnerability and exposure monitoring, we have these administrative level based assessment, which is sometimes quite difficult because we have an error propagation for sure. And still the population data and all these uh, socioeconomic data we have for um, on geospatial views is not as good as what we have for the biophysical one. And the question is who is affected. So we saw big gaps actually also between different maps, different population data sets um, in the numbers of people affected. So coming to a conclusion of my talk, we have really um, a huge potential with Earth observation. This is not something uh, new for everyone here, uh, which helps us to identify variable variables and understand the complexity and response to the uncertainties. 
who is affected. It's definitely, this is also what we saw in the project on drought monitoring with South Africa, Ukraine, but also in the activation of the charter with Sudan for the floods. Um, having these interdisciplinary exchange and with people directly on the ground, the ground that are involved simply helps to really uh, contribute to an adequate monitoring and reporting participatory approaches also as, as something like uh, geographic volunteer information, for example. Um, data knowledge and validation of results. This is also with exchange with people on the ground, but validation data is definitely something um, where, especially for national reporting, there I still see a gap. Interdisciplinary towards transdisciplinary, so involving policy and yeah, the national level who have has to make decisions and understanding actually approaches and frameworks. So what needs to be in the reporting? Um, we are in the golden age of data availability and accessibility. And with this, we can definitely move forward to the modeling. Also talks that have been done during the last uh, day. And yeah, capacity building, also nothing new that it's definitely the best tool and platform. Um, but we need people on the ground. So actually um, to exchange on what's happening and to know what is really what we see in the image compared to what is happening on the ground that will help us to do really good national reporting. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Valerie. That's an excellent presentation. I'd ask that um, people post their questions in the chat window or hold them until we have time for discussion at the end. Uh, I believe Ms. Hanke is uh, ready now from NRDCC. Uh, 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 Emma, if you wouldn't mind launching those slides, let's go. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Zhang Hanxian. It's my pleasure here to uh, share with you guys about the application of multimodal risk assessment in natural disaster risk trend analysis. Uh, next, please. Yeah. Um, so, as we all know, hazard and disaster are different conceptions. Hazard just a uh, uh, natural phenomena, while disaster combined hazard with social influence. So integrated risk monitoring and early warning uh, carry out a three dim uh, dimensional and dynamic monitoring risk assessment analysis and uh, early warning in an all around way, covering the whole processes in the development and change of virus disaster exposing and disaster inducing factors of multiplied disaster types, disaster chains and disaster systems. So there are three steps um, about uh, there are three steps in disaster risk monitoring and early warning. First one is risk monitoring, and then it's risk assessment, and uh, last one is a uh, risk early warning. Next, please. So right now in China, we build a space, air, ground, sea integra uh, integrated uh, monitoring system. Next, please. Uh, we use multimodal risk assessment and, and analysis tools such as a big data analysis, simulation calculation, and the risk prediction to uh, do the risk monitoring. And next, please. Uh, and with, through this method, we have uh, our uh, three products about risk monitoring and early warning. The first one is daily risk monitoring analysis and uh, the second one is flood and dry out analysis. And last one is top risk monitoring analysis. Next, please. Um, so first one, daily risk monitoring analysis report. Um, 
in this report, we have three different parts. The first one is meteorological information, and the next part is the disaster risk assessment. Uh, in this part, we include the flood and the geological disaster analysis, and the final part is the pre uh, precautionary advice. So in the right map is a disaster risk distribution map. Um, to make this map, uh, first we will collect hazards environment, exposure, and the vulnerability data, and put those data to the vulnerability model. And after a calculation, we use the result uh, and combine with dynamic critical rainfall data so we can get our flood risk area. So in this map, uh, the in this map, the red area shows with the flood high risk area, and the yellow one is the flood medium risk area, and the uh, green one is the geological disaster risk area. Next, please. And the second uh, second report is the flood and dry out analysis report. In this report, um, first, we will um, put some um, flood uh, basic information such as precipitation, water levels, and the condition of flood in less than 24 hours. And the next part is the forecast and the prediction. And this part includes future rainfall and water forecast and the risk analysis. The third part is the remote sensing monitoring. Uh, uh, which includes satellite remote sensing monitoring and aerial remote sensing monitoring. And then the focus of attention and the recommendations. The, red, uh, the right map uh, shows the key areas of the flood, uh, flood monitoring area. Uh, in this map, it well shows the station exceeded warning level, urban water logging monitoring areas, and high risk river and the flood flood monitoring areas and the small medium sized river flood monitoring areas. Next, please. So, the, oh, uh, just to show the last map. Yeah, thank you. Um, the last one is Typhoon Risk Monitoring uh, Analysis Report. In this report, first of all, we'll put some typhoon basic information, uh, and then it's the risk monitoring analysis. In this part, include the rainfall monitoring analysis, wind, storm suit, uh, ocean waves, and also typhoon risk analysis. And typhoon risk analysis will show in the right map. Uh, the, red, uh, the red place is the high risk, and the yellow one shows the medium risk. Then it's a historical similar, a similar typo. And uh, could you please show the next map? Yeah, yeah. So this map shows a typo in far to 2021. There are two similar types. Uh, uh, in the report, we will show how many people infected and building destroyed in these two similar typo and so that we can give some uh, information to the disaster managers uh, how to um, how to prepare for the disaster for the typo and the last uh, of this uh, uh, this report is the recommendations to those uh, disaster managers so that's all for my presentation thank you for listening Okay, was there a, a co-presenter that was going to do more or is or is that it that it? Okay. Uh, I suppose we move on now to uh, uh, um, uh, flood and drought monitoring. Um, uh, uh, is Mr. Okay. Mr. Lee ready? Yep. OK, take it away. So, OK, um, OK, it's my good honor to talking about something about the flood and the drought monitoring using the satellite imageries. And you mean from the NDRCC. OK, please go to the next. As you know that we have different kinds of disasters, and if 
when using a different remote sensing data to compare, to do some disaster monitoring using different imageries. Like that, we sometimes during the earthquake or some landslide happens, we, be, we use some very high spatial resolution data. But when we change to flood, maybe we will use some uh, moderate spatial resolution data and these uh, some kinds of repeat observations as one day we get uh, data per one day. And sometimes when we talking about uh, some drought, maybe that we need a long time to get this data and to find um, the change, uh, the trend of the disaster and to find the, what's the, where the disaster distribute and to some what you become. So as we know that different kinds of data using uh, different kinds of disasters using different uh, remote sensing data. Okay, please go to next. And as you know that we doing some disaster management in different disaster management circle, like the disaster risk monitoring and the emergency monitoring. And when the, the disaster risk monitoring, we need to think about to get the moderate spatial resolution data and to get some multi indicators. And it needs to have a wide observations and sometimes get the repeat observations in one day or two days or some several days. And during the emergency monitoring, the first thing we got to get the rapid response. We need to get the imagery after disasters as quickly as possible. And sometimes using different uh, data according to some disasters and used to some higher spatial resolutions. And also it needs to have the multi weather observations because uh, some disaster happens along with the cloudy and the rainy days. So we need to get the radar satellites. Okay, please go to the next one. Uh, as you know that China has some kind of the satellite imagery resources to disaster monitoring. Last year that we have launched the HD2, it's called the Environment and the Disaster Monitoring Satellites. And it has the 16 meters resolutions in uh, visible and near infrared bond. And China also launched the some satellites. Uh, we say that it's the uh, GF is higher resolution also observation systems. And now that we're using for the drought and flood monitoring, we're using those of the five satellites, it's GF1, 2, 3, 6. For GF1 and GF6, it has two and eight meters spatial resolution data. And it also can obtain the spatial resolution imageries with 16 meters spatial resolution. So as we find that the HD, Two and GF1 and GF6 can do the, some uh, disaster monitoring. It gets the ability to get 16 meters of resolution in one day. And so, as I have to mention, that we need to have the all weather satellites. So, we have the GF3, it has the C bond, it's a, a radar satellite. And also, you can say that the GF4. GF4 is a geostationary satellite. It can get the 50 meter uh, resolution data and it's very useful for some repeat response. Okay, please go to the next one. So that's when doing that uh, disaster monitoring, the first things we need to get some element monitoring. We know that for the drought and for the flood monitoring, uh, some kinds of index and some kinds of, uh, of the water, such as the water area is it's very useful and for the monitoring. We need to get the vegetation growth conditions and sometimes can get the soil moisture to find that useful to get, it's very useful to the disaster monitoring for the drought. And we can get the water area and it's very useful for the drought monitoring in some important rivers, important lakes and rivers. And it's during the, uh, for the flood mines, it also can get the flooding area. Okay, please go to the next one. For the drought monitoring, actually that is a slow process disasters. It needs to get integrated very kind of, a lot of kinds of informations. 
such as the precipitation, temperature, and soil moisture, vegetation conditions. And those kinds of information can be obtained by the remote sensing, sometimes, uh, such as the water area, sometimes the soil moisture, and uh, the vegetation conditions. But some kinds of the information, maybe we need to combine other information, sometimes the methodological monitoring. Uh, as we do, what we do is to combine those kinds of information together. We need to find some change happened through the methodological drought index and to combine this methodological drought index to such as VCI or TCI, those drought index by, can buy from the satellites to find that what's the change from there. As we know that the drought is a slow, slow process disasters. So we need to get the change every 10 days or every one month to find the change. And it will be very uh, useful for find some abnormal things happened. Okay, next one. Next. Okay, for the, for the flood monitoring, as I mentioned so that flood monitoring, it needs to have some repeat response. Repeat response as uh, happens in some cases, some in some cases that because of the dam being broken or some serious happen, gets the repeat response. So during this time that we have the GF4 satellites, when that happens, it can get a repeat, uh, repeat response. And then we so found that uh, if that from the demand and from the get to, to the get the get data, we usually to take about one to two hours. And after we finish the, these products, it will be only happens in three hours after this disaster happens. So it can be very quickly response for the disaster response. But it also have the uh, disadvantage of that it was uh, uh, optical satellite. So it will be get some uh, effect by the cloud and the rainy days. So during that time, we need to have the, 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 the uh, help from the radar satellites. Okay, let's go to the next one. Next. So this one is to take uh, the, the repeat monitoring that is happened in some uh, cloudy day or the rainy days that is very flash plant happened. And from this ones, we got the, this reader satellite. And because that the disaster happens, it uh, uh, repeat and cannot be forecast sometimes. So we need to get some other satellites come together, such as this ones using GF3 and uh, the Centennial satellite images, which combine those two informations to find where that the water is distributed and what's the change of the water distributes. Okay, next. One minute. Okay. Well, usually that the flood is not is changed along the time. So need we need to give some dynamic monitoring to building some multi sources data to so will be get the change of the water area to get the impact by the flood. Next one. Okay, that, that is my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for a most outstanding presentation. Um, I think uh, were we to award a prize for the coolest photo of a rocket ship uh, launching satellites, you, you definitely win and underscore the importance of uh, linking data qual uh, quantitatively with qualitative measures. Uh, next up will be the uh, Satellite Constellations for Water Cycle and Global Change Studies by uh, Jian Qing Shi. Uh, from the National Space Science Center, the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Uh, 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 Dr. Shi, please take it away. Can you see my uh, view graph? Yes, ready to go. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, um, my name is Jian Cheng Shi from the National uh, Space Science Center of Chinese Academy. And my talk is on the uh, satellite constellations for the water cycle and the global uh, change study. So the probably uh, 
the people here, it's already known the importance of the water cycle study and uh, the observation, so that uh, probably what I will not go through uh, those uh, for the sake of the uh, time. The basically, we know the global uh, change causing the temperature increase, and by the CC law, it's saying that if we increase the temperature by one degree, and it will, will cause the capacity to holding atmosphere ferric capacity to holding water uh, will be increased uh, 6 to 7 percent. And this will cause the precipitation change for the less rain, less light rain and greater rate and frequency for the heavy rain and also less snow. And it will increase the uh, UF transpiration and both will change the run of uh, the intensity. So the basically the climate change will causing the water cycle change, and also it has the great feedbacks to the Earth system. So that's uh, the actually in the way that we are not fully understood yet. There are so the basically we have the uh, we are interested in the science questions. They are include the characteristics of special and temporal distributions and their change at global and regional scales. And also we are interested in the water cycle and the climate feedbacks. And the third one is the water cycle acceleration is at a regional and a global scales. So the basically uh, we know that uh, a water cycle change will causing great risk on the drought and also the flood. And it will uh, result in the great impacts on the UN SDGs. So it will probably include the, those flood and the drought and the water resources and it impact on the food supply. So the effective science and the applications requires improved observation of the water cycle system for our understanding on the special temporal distribution and its change at different scales for provide the better uh, and better understanding and scales for the UN uh, SDGs. So this is uh, actually is uh, one of our project. It's on the uh, satellite constellation for the water cycle and global change, and this is supported by a Chinese academy. And the goal of this project is to establish a global water cycle observation and uh, at the observatory and develop the international collaborations to advance our understanding of water cycle change and its consequences. So uh, this project is actually uh, separated into the two part the first part is this year and the next year. It, this, uh, for this objective, we will uh, first base it on the China's current and planned satellites a constellation. We will first integrate the Chinese agencies and the research group to build the, the observation for system observation of what cycle. Then we are extended to international collaboration. Then finally, to for the to to for our uh, final goal. So the in the first objective during this two year, we are first uh, we have the uh, three tasks. And uh, the first is how to establish the constellation with the current satellites to build a water cycle observatory. And this includes uh, the survey of the monitoring capability of Chinese and the international satellite. And we are, have to do the uh, geometric and the radiometric cross calibration. And uh, then the, the second one is how to uh, improve and extend the historical data products for the global change study. And the third one is we we'll try to do a synergy between the satellite observation 
and the Earth system uh, process models. And we currently we have done uh, the many uh, works, and the one of this is uh, cross calibration with uh, other satellite for in, for Chinese satellite. And this is shown for Fengyun uh, 3B, 3C, and 3D. And the after a cross calibration and we, our validation shows that the, the radiometric calibration uh, accuracy can be significantly uh, improved. And uh, for the precipitation, probably is most important parameter, and in the water cycle. And it, what we're showing here is uh, this side is uh, the China's uh, uh, the microwave uh, satellite, and it can be used for uh, precipitation estimation. And this is uh, the other satellite uh, from uh, US and Japan. And what we are showing here is that actually this, they are all both included uh, dual frequency precipitation radar. And uh, if we only integrate the China satellite, uh, it will probably produce three to five hour uh, 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 measurements. But uh, the, for international collaboration, then we can uh, produce uh, one to uh, three hour uh, uh, data product. And here is uh, an example for the uh, microwave total precipitation water uh, products. And this is uh, only using microwave and it can generate three-hour uh, data products. And the, the second one is uh, soil moisture. Uh, we have uh, derived uh, improved uh, algorithms, and that can be used for the uh, small satellite uh, measurements. And they are mainly included uh, a new data uh, processing method to reduce uh, RFI uh, impact. Then we have a new technique to separate uh, vegetation and soil signal. Then also we do the uh, parameterized model for surface reflectance uh, estimation uh, for the, uh, to reduce the uh, uh, roughness impact. And so this uh, algorithm is actually can simultaneously uh, produce the vegetation uh, water content or optical uh, thickness and also produce uh, uh, soil moisture. And for the uh, ET, for the UF transpiration, and we have a, a ET a monitor, and it's actually it's a, a one of the algorithms. And this is uh, actually it can showing with uh, soil moisture than in the arid and semi-arid area, the, the ET estimation can be a significant improved. And for the uh, uh, for the gravity satellite, and it's uh, basically it can provide you the water storage, groundwater, and also the glacier uh, melting and the sea level change uh, estimation. And uh, in China, and we have also the uh, planned the, the missions uh, one in this year and one in the, uh, 2025. So that basically we have produced uh, the, the data from the gravity satellite measurements for the uh, groundwater and also the uh, water storage. And another com component of in the water cycle is uh, surface water. And this can be actually uh, the measured by the surface area of the water can be measured by many current the optical satellites and also the, the the height of the water can be measured by the altimetries from the radar and the radar and the laser altimetry. So here it's a couple of examples to showing the water storage change or lake uh, volume change. So the the second test task is how do we uh, uh, extended our uh, remote sensing measurements to the his, to the historical current and historical data. This is many preferred uh, referred to the C band and the X band since we have the good measurements from the L band. 
So we showing here is uh, an example with uh, uh, AR technique that then you, uh, improved the algorithm for the C band and the X band. So this is showing they have the very similar uh, capability and the uh, the error reduced produced it's very similar to the SMAP. It's a, a U.S. satellite for soil moisture. So we can actually extend the, the data, a soil moisture data products to the much longer uh, time frame. And the, the last task is actually is a synergy of satellite measurements with Earth system and application models. This is a, has a huge, uh, the, uh, many study uh, uh, in this uh, field. And here uh, we're just showing an example for optimization of the model parameters uh, using the soil moisture, surface uh, frozen soil, and the land surface evapotranspiration to uh, derive the from satellites uh, with multi-target parameterization technique to uh, produce a better expression for soil texture or the data uh, parameterized. So the, for uh, porosity and uh, hydrological uh, uh, the coefficients. And this can be performed at a very uh, different scale from the uh, high resolution to the coarse resolution. So this is uh, basically showing the improvement uh, over the, the, the common land uh, model, which is a uh, commonly used uh, atmospheric and the land surface uh, model. And those in this model, this is those parameters. Actually, they are the constant, and with the parameterization, and this is, can be changed from the uh, point one to five. And here one it's a, a, a improvement uh, over the, the this uh, figure shows the different. This is uh, showing the difference before the model improvement. And this is showing the significant reduction of the model for those uh, uh, parameters for soil moisture, frozen soil, and the ET. So in summary, it's basically uh, we are trying to uh, build a global uh, water cycle observation uh, observatory, and it will advance, hopefully it will advance our understanding of water cycle. And uh, the secondly, and those constellations uh, will establish cap uh, capability on monitoring a global water cycle system and for better understanding uh, the special and the temporal uh, variants. And it also provides a new opportunity to improve the current historical uh, measurements and also for the model uh, improvement. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank Most you, sir. informative presentation. And I must say, I'm very jealous at the uh, dedication and commitment of resources by the Chinese government to, to looking at and uh, this problem set. So thank you, and thank you for your, your time this evening. Uh, Ms. Emma, would you queue up the next presentation, please? And I'm taking notes of these questions, so we'll we'll revisit them uh, uh, in just a, in just a few moments. Uh, next up will be deep water rice field detection, reevaluating the 2011 flood in Thailand, and I believe our presenter is Jenta Komatoranen. Please forgive me for for fumbling names here, uh, sir. If you're present, yes. please, please or may yes. Can you hear ahead. me? Yes. Yes. Quite, Can you? Quite well. uh, okay. Wow. Well. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone, and thanks the organizer for having me in the event. I'm Jen Dajam Taranian. I'm going to present my study entitled uh, "Deep Water Right Field Detection Reevaluating the 2011 Flood in Thailand," of which I'm working with my academic team in different jurisdictions in the UK, Switzerland, and US. Next slide, please. Next, please. 
Um, I'm going to talk to cover five topics here, introduction, uh, data description, uh, methodology, results, and conclusion of my study. Um, photos on the right hand side were taken uh, during the 2011 flood over rice production areas in Thailand. Next, please. Uh, let me begin with the brief background of my study. Rice is a staple food in Thailand and rice farmers account for the biggest uh, proportion of total number of farmers. Nevertheless, rice is uh, vulnerable to weather fluctuations resulting in rice yield loss every year. Um, according to Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperatives of Thailand, during the period 28 to 2019, climatic events had affected 9.5 million farmers, of which uh, rice farmers held the largest share, and floods were major climatic constraint, constituting over 70% of the government budget. We chose to study the 2011 flood because it was the worst flood in history of Thailand and last for months in some areas. In addition, it caused the country to rise the top of the climate risk index for 2011. Furthermore, the same scale as the 2011 flood is expected to happen again in the future. Therefore, it is necessary to study rice production in responding to major climatic disaster like severe floods, highlighting the different rice ecosystem characteristic and nature under the long-term submergent condition. Next, please. For data description here for satellite image, uh, we use satellite product name Mod09A1 of 2011. We have four details for rice data here. First, Thailand has two rice seasons, rain-fed rice growing in rainy season and irrigated rice growing in dry season. In general, rice can be classified into the rice ecosystem, but Thailand has only three major rice ecosystems. Rain-fed lowland rice and deep water rice ecosystems belong to rain-fed rice season. Only one rice ecosystem for irrigated rice season. Next, please. Second, uh, rice has special characters about elongating ability and water depth tolerance. Um, according to Table 1, for three major rice ecosystems in Thailand, rain-fed and irrigated lowland rice cannot elongate and cannot survive if flood water exceeds uh, 80 centimeters. In contrast, deep water rice can slowly elongate and can survive if flood water is lower than 150 centimeters. Therefore, it can survive during long-term flood and be harvested finally. Third, we need to consider rice varieties because we need to monitor rice cycle from the beginning to harvesting. And finally, we collect rice statistics of 2011 at district level, but we obtain survey data of deep water rice from research team. We also discuss uh, with them for accuracy assessment and uh, for further information. Next, please. Well, before moving to methodology, I would like to briefly talk about rice growth development, as I believe that many of you may not know rice. On the left hand side, uh, the rice cultivation area is generally a combination of water surface and green canopy from rice leaves. Green leaves mix with water at the beginning on the right hand side, and then when the rice grows, uh, then only rice and no water during harvesting because water will be drained out. We then use surface reflectance value to calculate the vegetation indices NDVI and EVI and the water index LSWI representing uh, the green canopy and water thickness in the rice field. The combination of the three indices together with the rice growth development can help to identify rice pixels in the rice production area. Next, please.
For methodology, basically, we follow the threshold developed by CEO et al. However, the original algorithm is generally used for lowland rice field detection, particularly rain-fed lowland rice and irrigated lowland rice ecosystem, excluding other rice ecosystem. More specifically, the thresholds are unlikely to detect deep water rice during long-term floods, thereby drastically reducing the accuracy of satellite detection on rice field in flood prone areas. Next, please. Therefore, in this study, we need to modify the algorithm and propose new threshold to detect locations of major rice ecosystem in Thailand. As previously said, the original threshold of seal et al. exclude for deep water rice. So because it excludes a persistent water body pixel if the pixel has NDVI less than 0 0.1 and NDVI less than LSWI for at least 80 days in the year. As a consequence, it is unlikely to detect deep water rise during long-term submergence. To this end, we propose a new threshold that a true deep water rise pixel during a long-term submergence is identified if that pixel has either NDVI or EVI greater than 0 0.1 and LSWI greater than 0 0.1 for at least 80 days at that crop cycle. Next, please. For result here, as previously mentioned, basically we follow the algorithm of CO et al. However, the algorithm excludes the right field detection of deep water rise. As a consequence, the accuracy of deep water rise is considerably lower than the harvested areas from the statistic. For deep water rise here, we classify into two groups because the water rice was grown in 46 provinces across the country. However, only deep water rice growing in eight provinces had a flooding period over 80 days. According to Table 2, the accuracy of deep water rice after using the threshold of seal et al. in 46 provinces is about 25%, while the accuracy for deep water rice in eight provinces is only 11%. Next, please. Having realized the drawbacks, we then proposed new threshold to detect three major rice ecosystems in Thailand. So table three presents accuracy of three major rice ecosystem, rain-fed lowland rice, irrigated lowland rice, and deep water rice ecosystem. Again, deep water rice ecosystem here, we classify into two groups, 46 provinces and eight provinces. Overall, the accuracy for the three major rice ecosystem here will improve exceeding 80%. Next, please. So figure one on the left hand side presents different rice ecosystem of rain fed rice season, including rain fed lowland and deep water rice ecosystem. For rain fed lowland rice ecosystem presented by green color, deep water rice ecosystem presented by blue color for 46 provinces and red color for eight provinces. Figure two in the middle presents uh, rain-fed rice season, which is integrated both rain-fed lowland rice and deep water rice ecosystems. Figure three, the, the last one, presents irrigated rice season. Next, please. My research is quite applicable one. So we try to study and then try to uh, propose to the government because I'm working for the government of Thailand under Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperatives. So the, our results suggest that deep water rice should be grown in flood prone areas due to its elongating uh, ability and water depth tolerance. 
And the government should support right farmers in flood prone areas to cope with frequent and intense floods in the future. Doing so can help not only the government to save the budget, but also minimize rice production loss for rice farmers. Future prospect. After checking for the existing uh, literatures, we can conclude that our study is the first to successfully detect deep water rise in flood prone areas during a long term inundation. In the future, we would like to use our proposed stretch hole to explore deep water rise in Cambodia and Bangladesh. We are now collecting rice statistics of Cambodia, and then once we finish collecting data, we like to explore and then try to use our treasure hole to detect deep water rice in Cambodia. Next, please. Thank you very much for your attention and then for further comments. So please direct to my email as appear on the screen. Thank you. Thank you for a very informative presentation. Um, uh, I think the idea of taking advantage of climate change instead of fighting it makes uh, a tr tremendous sense. And please, if you have questions, post them in the chat meeting or, or chat window. And uh, uh, great job. Um, I guess I'm up next. Uh, um, Emma, if you run my slides for me, um, I will speak to the use of remote sensing for water conservation. Next slide, please. I, I think to state the obvious, uh, climate change is absolutely changing global rainfall patterns. Uh, of particular concern is drought in agricultural regions uh, due to these pattern changes. And um, ultimately, uh, and there's some very interesting papers, uh, most recently um, one published by the UN about linking uh, uh, government instability and violence um, to uh, the instability that's caused by disaster, particularly drought, which is a kind of a, a slow motion type of disaster that tends to be particularly destabilizing. Um, as with uh, anything to do with emergency management, we tend to think of uh, disaster management in in four phases. There's the planning, risk reduction, response, and recovery. The greatest return on, vest, on investment for uh, a government or an organization always occurs in the planning and risk reduction activities, as they say, a, a an ounce of cure, uh, an ounce of prevention rather, is worth a pound of cure. And so if we use this perspective to, to look at the issue of drought, really water conservation is the best means of reducing the consequences of drought. Next slide, please. And so um, I think there are uh, any number of remote sensing techniques uh, available to us to measure uh, vegetation health through NDVI, relative greenness, and similar measures. And these become particularly powerful measures when they're linked with local weather station data. Uh, as has been pointed out earlier, this provides a, a tremendously valuable ground truthing of what we see with uh, uh, satellite data and and particularly in calibrating the information so that we can get an earlier rather than later warning on the start of drought. Um, however, uh, returning to to my original point, preparedness through risk reduction activities uh, uh, by far has the greatest uh, impact on reducing negative impacts. And so remote sensing approaches that look not just to measure drought, but rather evaluate the efficiency upon which we move and use water, particularly in croplands, is tremendously important. Um, next slide, please. Now, uh, I came at this accidentally um, when I first worked on a project for USDA where we used a subsurface drip irrigation system to grow wheat 
and barley and cotton and uh, sorghum, and then uh, uh, found it prove even truer uh, when I moved to where I live now, which is Mississippi. And what we see here, where I live not 25 kilometers from the Mississippi River, bed fills with water. It creates hydrostatic pressure that moves the water underneath our protective levee systems and causes what's called a boil. Um, uh, this is uh, particularly common in porous soil types like sands. And we found that if you were to use thermal infrared, uh, as you see in the image at right, uh, the results are somewhat obvious. The, the water is cold, uh, bare surface is hot, and where water is penetrating up on what we call the inland side of the levee or containment system, we can detect leakage and therefore inefficient movement or uh, 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 transport of water, in this case through a river system. But next slide. It, it has just as much to do as it does in um, a, a an irrigated agricultural system. So here you see a, a photograph of uh, left of the Mississippi River at flood stage up against our levee. The levee here is approximately 10 meters above uh, uh, the uh, mean flood stage and there's heavy vegetation that makes it very difficult to detect places where the levee itself may be failing. So what I and some researchers at USDA, um, Dr. Thompson, Dr. Young Bo Huan, uh, did was to mount a thermal infrared camera system on a agricultural uh, airplane, a crop duster, and fly the sensor up and down the inland side of the levee in an attempt to detect leaks. Because what uh, eventually happens in this system over time is that as the water moves through the more porous soil, it will begin to wash it away and undercut the levee, causing a breach and a tremendous flood. And this is somewhat counterintuitive when a lot of people think about river flooding. They think about what's called overtopping, but that that in our levee system here is is far less frequent. So next slide, please. Um, that vegetation hides the leak until often it's too late. You have this nasty surprise, particularly when the inboard or uh, inland side of the levee system is covered with crops, as is is very common here in the southern US. And so here you see a very high resolution. We played with this one with a UAV with a $100 thermal sensor on it. And uh, we're, we're very quickly able to find leaks where there were small, uh, still small gaps in vegetative cover. There wasn't full canopy closure. Um, the cold water seeping uh, down and up underneath the levee or the retaining uh, 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 dike um, has a, 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 a symbology or classification in a remote sensing image that just simply jumps right off the screen at you and you, you can uh, spatially identify the location and and respond to this before it causes a failure in the levee system. Now, next slide please. The, the, the idea though isn't just applicable for flooding. If we look here is uh, uh, some imagery from Afghanistan. It, if I were to show you aerial photography of rural Mississippi here where I live or take most any place in the world, um, it doesn't uh, that's agriculturally intensive. It doesn't look terribly different from this. And, and what we're moving is water alongside roads in carry ditches 
uh, um, and these are frequently just compacted soil. It's very uncommon for 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 uh, particularly in developing nations for these carry ditches, which distribute water from river and and holding systems to be lined with a non porous material like concrete or plastic. And so they're subject to, to leak to water loss. And once you start seeing uh, any significant vegetation cover at all while the crop is in growth, detecting leaks in that system become very difficult to find until it's too late. You have a blowout, uh, uh, lose lose uh, uh, acre feet of of water, and it's it's wasted. So we have, we have a saying with USDA: water saved is water earned. And that levee system that we think about, or I think about with flooding. Uh, the same concepts have a lot of parallels in irrigation delivery systems. Next slide, please. Uh, so um, what's also interesting is that um, uh, the leak detection in irrigation systems not only works, but uh, uh, looks an awful like an irrigated field. And uh, so here at left, you actually see a dividing boundary here uh, about a third away across the image that is separating two fields. And, and what has happened here is at left, this field is under irrigation. This is water cooling as it flows down the furrows. Uh, between rows, but it is actually eaten away at the retaining header uh, of a weir here in the uh, 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 irrigation canal and sprung a leak and unbeknownst to the grower, it is uh, also flooding into an adjacent field that based on the temperature measurement isn't ready for irrigation. And so uh, uh, being able to detect these types of things, either through the use of inexpensive UAVs, manned aircraft, or depending on the scale, uh, I think we can get down to uh, 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 something reasonable from satellite based imagery, um, finding these leaks and getting them plugged through aggressive monitoring is is a critical uh, piece to future efficiency. Next slide, please. So uh, we can also use the same type of idea um, if we are looking at irrigated systems. In this case is a center pivot uh, 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 system. Um, while by no means is this an absolute measurement, and I think that's one of the important take home points is I don't care necessarily what the surface temperature is. I'm looking at relative differences, whether it's undermining the, the levee itself on a on a ditch, or in this case, it's water runoff from an irrigated system. You can see where there's uneven absorption of water um, as it's being delivered. So uh, uh, it also provides then some ideas for remediation. In this case, were I the grower, I would probably add some more organic material to the spots here in the field that are showing poor absorption or retention of water after the sprinkler rig has moved through the area. So um, another monitoring means just based on uh, simple, uh, real simple $100 thermal sensor. Next slide, please. And as I think we showed a, a little earlier, you can use the same type of idea, not just with a center pivot system. In this case, this is a level basin system, and we can find high spots in the furrows that are preventing full travel uh, uh, to the end of the field and um, can do again remediation. In, in this case, a, a very simple solution is we take an old welding uh, a cylinder uh, uh, that would hold nitrogen gas. Uh, it's about you know three meters tall, and we fill it with cement so that it weighs three, four hundred kilograms, and simply drag it down the bottom of the furrow to compact the soil. 
uh, uh, behind a behind a small tractor and problem problem solved, right? So we can figure out where to to level or compress and compact the soil so that we get even distribution, even flow of water across across the field. Again, it's about improving the efficiency at which we we deliver water to the system. Next slide, please. So there are um, some pretty inexpensive resources for collecting thermal data. Uh, basic UAV systems, including flight controls, can be less than $500 and cover almost, uh, we've been able to get almost uh, 1,000 uh, imperial acres uh, in during a day. Uh, and um, we're trying to explore the use of space-based thermal data, uh, particularly some of the Landsat data in band 6 and Landsat uh, bands 10 and 11 in, in Landsat 8. Um, so there's some good free resources and low cost resources available to start playing around with this idea. Next and hopefully last slide. Uh, so to, to summarize, risk reduction activities are the most effective means at reducing the consequences of disaster, in particular drought. Um, there are low cost and free thermal remote sensing platforms and sensors available. Um, we don't need to make precise temperature measures. Rather, we're more interested in just relative differences to identify trouble spots and that um, if we apply these two simple irrigation systems, whether it be uh, a, 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 a lateral and ditch system that is made out of uh, dirt or level basin irrigation or even center pivot, um, we can improve the efficiency uh, of these irrigation systems um, and make that drop of water go a bit further. Uh, and I believe that should be it. Next. So does it. Thank you for your time and attention. And uh, uh, Emma, if you'd queue up the next one. See, I got you by surprise. I went too fast. Ms. Emma, are you still there? Young gal? There we go, great. OK, here we go. Next will be uh, a multi-criteria modeling of drought, a study of Brandenburg Federal State in Germany. Uh, and this is by um, uh, Dr. Ogowumi. Please forgive me if I just bungled your name. Sir, are you here? Yes, I'm here. It's OK. All right, take it away. It's all yours. Thank you so much. Yes, my name is Taiwo Bumi, and you pronounce it very accurately. I really appreciate it. Yes, I'm an environmental researcher and also a current master student at the University of yeah, at, the, uh, at the United Nations University here in Germany. My this current research work is a paper that I wrote with one of my colleagues on much greater level of drugs. Next slide, please. Yes, as you can see from the slides, we on the, on, on the global context, we have over 1.43 billion people that have been affected by droughts so far, meaning that droughts to remain one of the second largest natural hazards that is affecting people all over the world. Meaning you can see that it's very, very important that we look at such issues and see how we can improve. Next slide, please. In this context, we're trying to look at the droughts in Germany, and what prompted this was because of the fact that in 2018, the German Institute for Solar Drought Monitoring declared that there's a historical flood, there's a flood, there's, sorry, there's a drought in, in some part of Germany. Then we decided to look at it, to look at one of the notable you know, state, states in Germany, that's Brunnesburg, and one of our key research objectives is to model the spatial variation of drought prevalence during this particular year. And then to examine the intensity on drugs of on agricultural land as well as you know food, very, very essential. And we will hopefully to see if we can be able to suggest you know solution on improving drought monitoring and better management. Next slide, please. So why do we decide to look at Brennersburg? Brennersburg is located in northeastern part of Germany. It's uh, as a, it occupies a very larger area of 29,000. And 
It's one of the most warmest region in Germany, over 14 degrees Celsius. And as you can see, the precipitation is close to less than 600 millimeters. And the most notable part of this place is that 45% of the area, you know, is covered by agricultural land. I mean, that is one of the major key activities that goes on here is agriculture. We have a lot of farmland in this place. So you can see that it's, it's worth studying to understand the impact of drought in this particular location. Next slide, please. So it's very essential that we understand that, you know, drought is a very complex, it's very complex and you know, we, it's very, very important that we make use of a modeling, a modeling structure to understand how we can, you know, be able to understand drought. And, and, and this is where the value of earth observation and GS analysis come into place. That is to be able to really know the impact of flood and also to monitor the changes. In this particular context, we decided to look at one of the three key variables, despite the fact that there are so many, many variables, but we we'll check into literature and look at how we can be able to summarize and choose the essential variable. So in this context, we consider rainfall intensity, we consider land surface temperature, and the normalized different vegetational index to be able to generate a flood prevalence map that proves that there was flood at this particular time. Next slide, please. This is the diagram. It is the diagram representation of the of the key key steps and the workflow that, that has been used to analyze drought. And as I mentioned earlier in the previous slide, land surface temperature is put into factor in the rainfall intensity and NDVI. All these all this, uh, data are being sourced and you can see up there that Landsat, Landsat 8 imagery is one of the key, you know, the key data sets that was used to, to generate land surface temperature and NDVI. The rainfall data set is gotten from one of the departments in Germany that provide the rainfall information, which I will explain in my next slide. So for the rainfall intensity, we 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 collect data, you know, on rainfall, which which show us that between the year 2016 and 2018, there is a decline in rainfall. So you can see the previous year we have you know rainfall amount of between three seven three to six three three, and then this declined so you know so extremely in 2018, and as you can see one of the contributing factor of drought is you know low rainfall and high evapotranspiration. So meaning that at this particular time of the year 2018, Paris they, they experienced a very very low amount of rainfall. Next slide. Another key variable that we consider is the land surface temperature. And then in, in, in doing this, we have to make use of the earth observation power. And that's using the Landsat head imagery. Why? Because it's measured really very quick and it's very cheap open source available on the USGS. So this, the, the land surface temperature was generated using the thermal band, the band 10 of Landsat 8. And we should, it's very important that we know that this estimation depends on, you know, the vegetal cover, the soil moisture of the particular object. So the, it, after mapping this, it was evident that we have, you know, a very high surface temperature at the northern part of the Brandenburg and some other part of the area itself. So which is, is, is another very indicator of the fact that, you know, this area can be really affected by drought. Next slide. So yeah, the, the third essential variable is the normalized different index, and this is also the same way it, we use Landsat 8 to to detect this. And NDVI is very very essential. It's to test the the vegetational strength of a particular area. It's measured between minus one to plus one, and the the minus one always is it connotes negative limit value. And it it's, 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 it's can also represent areas that are full of water, whereby we have you know between between close to one point so close to one, you you can also assume that this particular area um, have a very heavy vegetation. And as you can see, for the case of Beresburg, it shows that we have a very limited area that are close to one. That is, it's also a sign of the fact that there are a lot of stress on the on the trees, a lot of stress on the forest cover, a lot of stress on, stress on the agricultural land. During this particular season, don't forget that we try to ensure that we make use of a Landsat imagery for that particular year to be able to examine. 
Next slide, please. So after we have all these variables and we have mapped them, the most important thing is to weight them. We make use of the AHP approach, that is a analytic analytical processing approach to be able to weight all these three variables, then to, to have the final drug prevalence map, which is shown on the next slide. On this next slide, this, here comes the, the drug prevalence map as of 2018, and which is showing that a very higher proportion of this particular study area truly experienced higher drugs as declared by the the, the Dutch monitoring drug monitoring you know department and it's it's really it's really also explained that a very large portion of the area you know really experience high drugs whereby we have a very small portion that have extreme drugs and as you can see next slide please in order to achieve our next objective that is to be able to understand the agricultural land that has been affected by this particular drought in this particular year, which is our objective too. We make use of the Landsat 8 again to analyze the land use and land cover of this particular area. And we decide to, to group them into classes to know where we have heavy vegetation, light vegetation, water body in that order. And also to prove, you know, to, to prove the background information that we have about the study area, it shows quite well that agricultural areas still cover some 3% of this area. You know, in, in contrast to how we have combined water body or barn and bar land together to form the non agricultural area, which is just 27%. Next slide. So, in order to be able to understand the extent of agricultural land, including forests that have been impacted by this drought of this particular year, we decide to, to look at intersection to know which area, you know, which agricultural land fall within, you know, the, 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 the drought zone. And then the results shows that you know almost seventy seven percent, you know, of the of the agricultural land, according to our land use land cover classification, is been affected by these drugs. So you mean that this is it, it, that means that almost all the farm, you know, have really felt the impact of this drug at this particular time. Next slide. And. With these, we, we decided to provide some very, very essential recommendations, which can get future research, which can also help for further future planning. As a matter of fact, in as much as you know, climate change in part continues, it's very, very important that we use the power of geospatial technology and this observation to see how we can be able to, to address you know, the, the, the changing environment. As highlighted in, in, in this presentation, it's very evident that you know, in order to, to be able to give drought relief funds, you know, using such a drought impact map, it can be used, you know, for, for, for better, you know, for better representation. And this can also be able to, to know, you know, which of the farmers that we can always channel, you know, fund into. And at the same time, this can also be an avenue to be able to provide good adaptation strategy for those farmers, you know, good strategies on how they can be better be informed. Another thing is very essential that this paper is recommending that there should be, must be a future proactive drought early warning system so that people will not be caught on our way. To get it and it has been all showcased even from the previous presenter that you know earth observation and GISS analysis is a very very good tool to be able to to address such natural hazard like drought that is to prevent and to to be water prepared for drought strike and we are we're, we're strongly recommend that the 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 plan model that is the use of precipitation land surface temperature and normalized vegetation this can also is also very good indicator that future research can make use of you know into additional criteria that we'll be using to to assess the drought impacts thank you so much thank you sir uh, yet another brilliant presentation uh, i think we're on the home stretch here is dr wu ready Oh, sorry, P Professor Wu cancelled his presentation. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Well, I'm quite sorry to hear sorry. that. Let's let's um, jump into the questions that I've I've made note of here. Uh, first, uh, for uh, Valeria Gras, um, Cohen asks, "Hi, Valerie. Very nice presentation. 
Did you also differentiate by gender when doing the overlay with population data? To your opinion, would it make any sense to do if combined with sufficient info about local food systems? Um, uh, Valerie, did you catch that? Yes, I saw the question. It was actually quite interesting. So when it comes to gender differentiation, we we actually already did some testing with the data set from GPW version 4, which also differentiates between gender and also age. So it would be quite interesting to see in case of a disaster, like how many women children are affected. Uh, with regard to the idea to combine it with local food system, that's mm -hmm. actually a quite good one and I would see it as recommendable because it helps to make the link from agricultural production being affected towards the people affected. So that's quite an interesting one, yes. Yeah, and, and I've, I've, I, I can take it offline with you, Valerie. There was some interest, um, somebody spun at me on this from World Food Program. So if, if, if you drop me a quick note, I will try to dig out their contact info and get you connected. Um, also for you from Vasquez, uh, thank you, Valerie, for your presentation. Does South Africa have policies for raster bodies protection and conservation in those drought risk areas? And I got to tell you, I, I visited Eastern Cape every year for the last 12 years and it's beautiful but you speak truth about the drought there um any any help for vasquez so with regard to the policy there is something going on also monitoring but i'm not quite sure at, at this point to my current uh, knowledge there is something on water body protection conservation um so our approach, which we developed in evidence and actually picked up by the NDMC, so the National Disaster Management Center. Um, so there is still further research going on, especially with regard to drought risk uh, monitoring measuring. But um, yeah, I'm not sure how good actually these policies are yet implemented, to be honest. OK, thank you. Uh, next, uh, a question for uh, Louis or Liao. Uh, this from Nura Shanono, uh, just a compliment saying what a, what a nice presentation. Um, I think Dr. Shi has some comments here as well. Uh, George asked, is the Water Global Cycle Observatory open to governments or to research or other, other non-government organizations? And his answer was a very affirmative and resounding yes, um, a uh, uh, request from uh, uh, Christina Vasquez uh, to uh, Dr. Shi, would you please share your email if you wouldn't mind perhaps entering it into the uh, chat box. Uh, I think some people wanted to follow up with you. And then lastly from uh, Vina Shashikant to Dr. Shi, uh, or, or I'm sorry, Dr. Jiang Cheng, uh, in slide number 10, how do you separate the vegetation and soil signal and any further information on the technique you, you mentioned? Uh, uh, an amazing presentation. Yeah, the, uh, actually I, I put in my email in the box. Ah, very and, good. Uh, and also I asked him to send me email, then I will send him the papers related to this technique. Uh, uh, outstanding. Th thank you, Dr. Shi. Um, uh, uh, Professor Zheng Cheng, um, mm. were you able to answer the question about slide 10 in your presentation? Yeah, that's uh, the question, how to separate uh, vegetation and soil signal. Yes, from... yes. So I ask him to send me an email, then I will send him the related papers. OK, very, very, very well. Thank you. It's it's uh, uh, a lot to keep up with with chat and presentations and all. Um, I, I think that's it. I just have a, a final uh, comment um, to, to Fatima and Yao, uh, Mariam. I've seen your name scroll by here um, and all my friends at ISA. Thank you so very much for, for hosting this and the same to 
uh, all of my friends globally for for participating, your wonderful colleagues, and I miss you so very much. Um, uh, particularly saddened that we won't be able to get together in Beijing. And uh, David, I saw your name scroll by. Uh, look at what you started 17 years ago. Uh, so back over to you, Shuresh. Thank you. So thank you, Talbot. Uh, this has been wonderful and also very timely, probably before the time session. And uh, I appreciate that you are sitting in a place where I think we started this workshop. It was probably one o'clock and right now it must be getting almost six o'clock, right? In the night. So uh, one o'clock in the night you started and now until morning you are up with us and. Uh, That's right. It's, it's time to go to work. <laughs> yeah, it's time to go to work. I hope you I better not you, be late. Still office. You, you still have to go to home and then go back to work. I hope. <laughs> so that's great. I mean, I really appreciate uh, the, the time you've taken and whole night you have stayed awake to, to our, uh, present and also moderate this session. So salute your courage and spirit to be with you and Spider. Uh, and yeah, uh, 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 as you said, this these were such a Excellent technical studies. Uh, I think and we are benefiting a lot and learning a lot from all this. So thank you, all presenters, and also Talbot especially for keeping awake and moderating this session so wonderfully. Uh, and that ends the today's uh, sessions. So, so we have done four sessions, and tomorrow again we have same time. And uh, my colleague Emma will send you a new link. Uh, for session five and six, so please monitor your emails and click on this link. The time remains the same. Uh, we had problem with previous link, as all of you know, so we don't want to take any risk to keep the same link. So we will send a new links to you for tomorrow. Uh, so thank you and uh, have a nice day uh, or evening where, wherever you are in the region. So 